o'clock. Let's get started, please. Uh, today is another in our series of LC's Digital Future and You, and we obviously have some big draws on the agenda this morning. Uh, neither of whom, and I think there'll be a group actually, need much introduction, but since one of them was my former boss, and in some respects still is, uh, I'm happy <laughs> to bring him forward. So today we have um, Mark Sweeney, who is the Principal Deputy Librarian of Congress, and Steve Short, who works in library services as head of the business analyst team. And they are pairing to give us some information in leading us into the future and the user-centric focus of the library. So um, I think Judith heard Mark deliver this at Catholic U and was so struck she came back knocking on my door, we have to get Mark for this session. So I said, well, work on it and we'll do that. So we have brought that to realization today and I think you'll have a simulating session and uh, learn a bit more about how all of these things work together. So Mark is the principal uh, deputy librarian, former associate librarian for library services and Steve Short. And I think you'll have some of your staff members joining you from the business analyst team. And I think we'll have a lively session this morning. So join me in welcoming, welcoming both of them. And we'll start with Mark. So good morning, everyone. I want to thank. Uh, Angela Kinney and Judith Cannon for inviting me to participate in this month's uh, program. Uh, as Beecher said, I made a very similar presentation in February at the Bridging the Spectrum um, Symposium at Catholic University, and I'm really glad to have an opportunity to share it with you um, today. So my presentation is gonna be in three parts. Um, I'll begin with a broad overview of the core functions and services of national libraries. Um, including a brief look at three different national libraries and how they compare with the Library of Congress. And then I'll introduce the Library of Congress's new strategic plan, enriching the library experience, um, as well as our new digital strategy. And finally, I'll share insights into two of our key initiatives, um, one developed uh, more than a decade ago, and then another that was recently be begun that I think demonstrates the library's digital strategy in action and also exemplify how we're fulfilling our core functions as America's de facto national library. So my perspective on core functions of national libraries is uh, largely drawn from my experience um, with IFLA and uh, also the Conference of Directors of National Libraries, uh, as well as an opportunity to make site visits um, that I've made over the course of you know, many years um, um, through IFLA. So IFLA's National Library section is a focal point for supporting the vital role of national libraries in society as custodians of the world's intellectual heritage, providing organization, preservation of, and access to national imprint in all its forms. Affiliated with the NLS is CDNL, an independent association of chief executives of national libraries established to facilitate discussion and promote understanding and cooperation on matters of common interest worldwide. So it's through these two organizations that I have an opportunity to interact with my national library peers during our annual gatherings where we you know, discuss emerging trends, explore various approaches to common challenges, um, and enjoy the opportunity for this transnational dialogue. For example, at this, at this year's IFLA's conference, I'll be presenting and moderating a panel on the innovative use of library spaces. So what makes a national library? Well, first, a national government designates the institution to one degree or another. Responsibilities necessarily vary from country to country based on the unique or shared history, culture, and politics. What is apparent with all is that national libraries generally exercise four core functions. 
A recent IFLA National Library Section survey of national library functions conducted with the purpose of updating UNESCO's guidelines for legislative national libraries confirmed that these remain in place today as they did in uh, the late 90s when it was first uh, promulgated. So first and foremost, build a national collection. Perhaps the most fundamental function of a national library is to build a national collection by collecting its national imprint, the cultural heritage of its people, as recorded in a wide variety of works or content in many, many different formats. Most, most content will be acquired through legal deposit, though the scope of materials covered by such legislation differs from country to country. Legal deposit is often enhanced and supplemented through a variety of other acquisition methods, whether they be agreements negotiated with publishers, such as voluntary and partial purchase agreements, or through collaborative acquisitions with other cultural heritage partners. Indeed, by collecting the national imprint, a national library serves as a backstop to other research libraries in the country. Second, preserve the national collection, and that's both physical, of course, and digital. A natural extension of the collecting mandate is the responsibility to ensure the preservation of the national collection for current and future generations of users. The challenge for national libraries is to ensure that all types and formats of, of collection content receive an appropriate le level of preservation treatment to ensure their perennity. And third, discover the national collection. National libraries provide controlled bibliographic discovery and access to the national heritage collections through online catalogs and the national bibliography. The challenge for national libraries is to provide standard cataloging data as soon as possible after collection content has been acquired in order to distribute the cataloging metadata to publishers, libraries, and individuals nationwide. And finally, obviously, access the national collection. The purpose of the first three activities is to make in the nation's knowledge and cultural output accessible to national constituencies. Primary national libraries users are typically designated by law and regulation, while digital content holds the promise of broader access across national or international borders, current intellectual property rights restrict how broadly that content can be shared or repurposed. While virtually all national libraries consider these activities to be core to their mission, there is no single approach to how countries situate their national libraries. So talk a little bit about a couple other models. So one national library model would be that of the Library and Archives Canada, which is a single federal institution under the Department of Canadian Heritage. It's tasked with acquiring and making accessible the country's documentary heritage, both the people's published creative output, acquired largely, again, through legal deposit, how essential that is for a national library, um, and the archival records of the Canadian government. And Library Archives Canada is also experimenting right now with joint service locations with public libraries, one on the West Coast in, uh, in Vancouver and now in Ottawa, different, different sort of model. The Bibliothèque Nationale de France, it collects, preserves, and makes known the documentary uh, history and heritage of France. The BNF is a public institution under the supervision of the Ministry of Culture and Communication that serves not only as the national repository for all that is published in France, um, again, acquired through legal deposit, uh, but also as the most significant collector of works published worldwide in the French language. So there we have the culture extended beyond the physical or geographic borders of the nation to the actual language of the culture. And a final example that I've put out there is the National Library of Finland. Uh, that's the oldest and largest uh, research library in Finland, formerly known as the Helsinki University Library. The NLF is an independent institution that's part of the University of Helsinki and under the supervision of the Ministry of Education and Culture. Like in Canada and France, the NLF collects the national published output of Finland through legal deposit. However, it's also charged with providing centralized access to electronic materials for all universities, research institutes, and the public, public libraries. They also operate a world-renowned National Digitization and Conservation Center. Three examples. 
Well, then there's the Library of Congress. <laughs> okay. So the library um, clearly shares with other national libraries the four core functions that I've just detailed. However, its aspirations and work are much more expansive than those peers. I think the library uh, historian, John Cole, um, best framed the agency when he said, I quote, it occupies an important crossroads in America's life, a place where the nation's political and literary cultures intersect, end quote. So over the last 218 years, it has evolved into a multifaceted cultural institution serving a national and international audience. Through a wide array of activities, programs, and services. An agency of the legislative branch, the Library of Congress is the major research arm of Congress, America's de facto national library, the nation's copyright agency, provider of a national library service for blind and readers with print disabilities, and a partner in bibliographic and digital network development. I believe that it's the dual nature as both a legislative library for the US Congress and the de facto national library is the key to this library's success. The effective combination of these two basic functions has brought together the concerns of government, librarianship, and scholarship. It's an unusual combination, but one of great benefit to the American people, the society, and our culture. So how is the library positioning itself for the next few years? So under the leadership of Dr. Hayden, um, a new strategic plan was uh, implemented to guide our agency over the next five years. That's 2019 through 2023. Dr. Hayden is often uh, heard stating to staff what uh, the eighth librarian of Congress, Herbert Putnam, noted more than a century ago. Quote, a book used is fulfilling a higher purpose than a book that is merely preserved. End quote. The traditional strengths of collection development, bibliographic description, and preservation are important means, but the ultimate end is that the collection is being used. This principle is being applied to all parts of our agency, both services and programs. Um, it all must be accessible and it must be used. The library's new strategic plan, Enriching the Library Experience, is our roadmap for expanding the library's national research, reach and deepening our impact, thus fulfilling the mission to engage, inspire, and inform our users. Before we get into details, I want to share with everyone a reminder of the big picture. That's the mission and the vision for our de facto national library. So first, the mission. Engage, inspire, and inform Congress and the American people with a universal and enduring source of knowledge and creativity. I should note that the universal scope of the library's collections goes well beyond the standard acquisition of national creative output that all other national libraries follow. Three fundamental principles, or canons, first promulgated in the, by the library in 1940 form the basis for our overall collection development policy today. The first being that the library should possess all books and other library materials necessary for Congress and the various officers of the federal government to perform their duties. Second is that the library should possess all books and other materials, whether in original form or in facsimile, which record the life and achievement of the American people. And third, that the library should possess in some useful form the records of other societies, past and present, and should accumulate in original or in copy full and representative collections of the written records of those societies and peoples who experience is most of a is of most immediate concern to the people of the United States. Those are the canons of 1940 and they're the foundation on which all of our recommending activity um, is based. So given the exponential growth uh, of creativity, the library will increasingly be selective in what we add to the collection, but the overall scope will remain expansive and universal. So I'm gonna repeat that because I think it's really important for all of us to understand that the library will increasingly be selective in what we add to the collection, but that the overall scope will remain expansive and universal. 
So also, as a steward of a unique and universal uh, national collection that belongs to the American people, the library has a mandate to inspire, inform, and serve all Americans by engaging their cultural and intellectual curiosity, curiosity and creativity. And that, that leads to our vision, which is very intentionally aspirational. It's a real reach. Um, but I think uh, an institution like the library is deserving of a real, a real reach. So our vision. All Americans are connected to the Library of Congress. So the prior strategic plans that the libraries had is emphasized the unique charges of each of the individual departments of the library. There was a goal for CRS and a goal for copyright and a goal for library services. Um, However, in this plan, the one that we're operating under now, um, the agency determined that an effective strategic plan for the library must be built on concepts that transcend our organizational boundaries and unify our discrete service units, those being library services, law library, copyright, congressional research, national library services, the line, as well as the office of the librarian. It is important that we create collective language and themes that will pull this all together. So we drew inspiration from the Thomas Jefferson's organization that's always uh, safe here at the Library of Congress and um, of his collection to articulate the shared um, cross-agency description of the role of the Library of Congress um, through the concepts of memory, which is referring to our work to acquire, sustain, and provide access to a unique and universal collection. Knowledge, which captures our role to provide authoritative, objective research, guidance, analysis, and information. And imagination, which includes inspiring and encouraging creativity and promoting and supporting the protection of the work of creators. So each service unit supports these concepts in one way or another. We also defined a shared view of key user groups across the agency. So first, Congress, obviously, um, by far our most important user, and we support access to authoritative information and the de democratic exchange of ideas. Also then the creators, um, who we define as researchers, originators of new knowledge and scholarship, builders of cultural capacity, and copyright users and stakeholders. Next, we have our learners, those of any age who seek understanding and knowledge through the library's digital and physical collections and services. And then finally, connectors, the external communities such as libraries, schools, and other groups that ultimately connect users back to the library. Most importantly, we agreed to focus on an agency as a user-centered direction forward developing a strategic plan that would en enrich the library experience for Congress creators and connectors and more actively engage learners of all ages with what is truly a set of unique and trusted resources available here at the library. Have establishing that foundation, we were intent on providing a clear, forward-looking and user-centered strategic plan that would be relevant and guide all parts of the agency. It begins with that aspirational vision. So all Americans are connected to the Library of Congress. This reflects a strong commitment to focus on our users, better understanding their needs and making our universal collections, our enduring source of knowledge and creative more discoverable, more accessible, more relevant, and more useful. We'll work towards this vision through the plan's four strategic goals and accompanying objectives and every one of us at the agency needs to connect our work to one or more of these following goals. So our first goal is to expand access, uh, making our unique collections, our expertise, our experts, and services available when, where, and how users need them. Whether they're visiting us physically here on Capitol Hill or whether they're accessing the library remotely. This can mean many things, but we're particularly interested in increasing discoverability, the availability of our collections, and using connectors, those external communities, to extend our reach and expand our physical presence. Our second strategic goal, to enhance services, 
creating meaningful experiences for every user by elevating digital experiences, transforming in-person experiences, and developing more, a more user-centered content. First and second goals certainly connect to the core functions of national libraries to provide access to national collections, and assumes that the library has the other three core functions well in hand. Our unique collections can only be made available if we collect the national imprint, we preserve it, and ensure that we have appropriate metadata for all of our holdings. Oh. Sorry about that. Our third goal, optimize resources, continuing our work to modernize and strengthen, streamline our operational capabilities, invest in our staff for the future, and to diversify and expand our funding to do even more to connect to people with our collections and services. The other presentation that will follow this, I think, is you know, extremely relevant, especially to this goal. And our fourth, fourth and final goal is to measure impact. We're committed to gathering and using data to better understand our users and to share the powerful story of the impact that this library has on users around the world. This means we have to, have to actively learn how to capture, um, use, and understand data um, about our users and their needs while, of course, safeguarding their privacy and you know, we'll communicate the impact in using the data to set the goals and targets and strengthen our overall performance management as an agency. The third and fourth goals align less directly with the core functions of national libra libraries. However, optimizing resources and measuring impact are sort of foundational activities that enable the library to successfully execute um, on our core functions and meet all of our mission objectives. So, Together, these goals will certainly necessitate new work, learning, and initiatives over the period of the plan. But most importantly, these goals align with the priority that the library service units have already established for 2019, and they're certainly present in all of the directional plans that I've had an opportunity to review over the last couple of months. So a couple of examples. You know, right now, library services has a priority to de decrease the special collections or rearage. Um, and CRS is, has a priority to expand access through public release of the non-confidential reports um, and making them available to users. So those are very well, those two are very well aligned with expanding access. Um, as does the library's work that she uh, is undertaken to develop the master plan to enhance the library's um, Jefferson Building um, visitor experience. And you know, the National Library Service for the Blind and Physically Handicapped, they have a number of different um, pilots and projects um, that align with both expanding access, um, but also enhancing services um, for uh, our sight impaired users. So right now in, NL in NLS, they've prioritized Braille um, e-reader pilot for refreshable Braille display that has the potential to dramatically um, improve um, service for over 30,000 um, Braille readers nationwide. Um, and measure, measurement of what's working and not working from that NLS pilot in line with, is in line with our goal for measuring impact. will help determine where best to invest resources for the greatest impact in that area. And I'd say finally, copyright, um, the modernization initiative, it spans uh, our, our, uh, our new strategic goals of expanding access and enhancing services to users through improved recordation and through the copyright registration systems, and of course, optimizing resources through business processes and organization reviews planned as part of the initiative. In addition to our strategic goals, uh, we are being deliberate in establishing principles to guide us on this journey. I've already noted our commitment to be user-centered, and we're also committing to being more data-driven in order to make the best um, decisions possible, and we also, also want to be more digitally enabled. We've already done some good work to build upon um, to be more data-driven. We've long collected important statistics on how many people entered the library, visits to reading rooms, visits to websites. We have a strong understanding of our collections, um, uh, how many items we've added, uh, how many items we've circulated, how many preservation actions we've taken. We've got lots and lots of those types of statistics. 
As well, our, uh, the OCIO provides monthly reports on our public website performance and availability. But where we're less knowledgeable um, is about some of our users, a gap that we must fill if we're to better meet their needs. We want to be able to measure the impact of our programs and services and then use that information to make uh, data-based decisions going forward. Our third commitment is to be thoroughly and strategically digitally enabled so that we might best thrive in this increasingly digital world. And to accomplish that goal, the library has adopted a new digital forward strategy that harnesses technology to bridge geographical divides, expand our reach, and enhance our national services. So now I'm just gonna transition into the digital strategy of the library. So the digital strategy complements the library's strategic goals and describes what we plan to accomplish in terms of digital transformation over the next five years. This transformation applies to all of the library's programs. Digital technology enables us to sustain and expand services to all users, bridging gaps and strengthening connections. The digital strategy describes how we will use each interaction as an opportunity to move users along a path from awareness to discovery to use and finally to a connection with the library through three main goals. We're gonna throw open the treasure chest, we're gonna be connecting, and we're gonna be investing in the future. So as Dr. Hayden likes to say, we're gonna throw open the treasure chest. The library's con um, content, its programs, its expertise, their national treasures, and we're dedicated to sharing them as broadly as possible. The growth of the library's digital content, which includes our collections, has increased exponentially every year. We don't really measure it well, and we don't, we don't uh, outwardly state it yet, but it is exponentially every year. And we want to make that content available and accessible to more people. We're carefully to respect the expectations of Congress and the rights of creators and support the use of our content in software-enabled research, exploration, and learning. And second, we're going to connect. The library offers an incredible wealth of content and programs services to Congress and the American people. And we strive to connect with our users by making those services and content accessible for all, inspiring lifelong relationships with every website and in-person visit, and bringing the library to our users, welcoming other voices and driving momentum in our communities. And third, it's about investing in our future. The library is dedicated to preserving the wisdom and creativity of past generations serving our current users, and looking forward to future needs. <clears throat> we'll engage in the active work of preserving our digital collections, of safeguarding our content and meta metadata, and ensuring the usability of what we make available over time. We will engage with new technology and new communities. So how do we actualize um, these strategic goals at the Library of Congress? And how does this work reflect the evolution of national libraries in the 21st century? Well, at the Library of Congress, uh, we identify opportunities for the agency to build towards its long-term vision through shorter-term objectives. And the work is never, ever done, but constantly evolving to meet the needs of our users and to match the extent of our resources. Furthermore, everything we're doing right now at the library clearly reflects the four goals or four functions that national of national libraries that I detailed earlier. So to make this point a little, a little more tangible, um, I thought I'll, I'd share two examples of the, what I consider the library digital strategy in action. So the first embodiment of the digital strategy, I think, is the National Digital Newspaper Program. Now that's a, a partnership with NEH um, and the library to provide permanent access to a free national digital resource of newspaper bibliographic information and digitized historic newspapers. So this program builds on a legacy of, strateg of a strategically successful program, the United States Newspaper Program, that we partnered with NEH for more than 25 years. And while that was about inventorying and cataloging and microfilming newspapers, um, uh, it does give you a sense of when, we are, when we're partnered with the right connectors, how we can enhance a national collection 
um, and make it relevant for all Americans. Um, and before I dig into the program's goals, the first thing to understand is a little bit about, you know, why I think newspapers in our society is so important in the 19th and 20th centuries. So you all know that, you know, newspapers were largely the form of information distribution in the mid uh, 19th, up in the 19th and up to the mid 20th century, um, when broadcast radio and television came in. And of course, now we have the internet which changes everything entirely. Um, but before all of that, you know, the daily or the weekly newspaper, that was the primary tool for sharing events of the day um, and recording um, the public, uh, its community, and it's a key resource for understanding local history, our national history, and for genealogical research. Obviously, with freedom of speech and protection of free press as core components of our democratic system, Newspapers pro proliferated in every city and town in the country, um, documenting those communities, and it takes a lot to manage this. There's over 154,000 unique titles published in the nation, nation since uh, 1690. And while uh, this particular type of material um, uh, is uh, voluminous, um, it's also um, was designed to be ephemeral. So, Newspapers frequently printed on the cheapest paper, poorest ink quality, lowest pr production quality, and from an archival point of view, we have a challenge in the form of a voluminous amount of poor quality material that provides a primary source for documenting our nation's history. In addition, these historical records were generally valued most by the local communities, um, and that created a situation where um, the, the corpus was geographically dispersed. So we're Unlike, say, the British Library or the BNF, where they hold all the newspapers ever published in their country in a single institution, in the United States, it's the exact opposite. It's dispersed throughout the country. So in terms of providing discovery and access to these materials, by nature, a uh, newspaper is, a, is also complicated by the fact that it's a discrete um, compilation of information components that may or may not relate to each other. So you've got ads, you've got articles, you've got photographs. It's a mis mishmash of a whole lot of different types of content that makes it uh, a challenge to provide useful description and using, uh, with using you know, the general library practices. So, NEH and the Library of Congress in the early 2000s partnered up, said we want to take this old program, which was based on an analog output, microfilm, and we want to make it more accessible to, um, to users. Um, and that's what we set out to do. And with the funding that we've received from NEH and that they've sent out to connectors across the country, as well as the technical support that we have here at the library, defining the, the technical standards, the ability to aggregate the content, um, you know, we've developed a, a broad um, national program um, that using these standards to ingest um, and to manage and make accessible um, a pretty voluminous amount of material. And today, you can access this. This is the product of 47 different institutions. So 47 connectors plus the Library of Congress plus NEH, almost 50 altogether, working together across the the country in a network community. And right now, you can access 2,600 titles, more than 15 million newspaper pages. Now, that's, that's created real um, challenges for us um, as we build a, a corpus that large of such text-intensive material. Um, but the work continues. Um, we make it accessible, user-friendly web interface. And these resources can be accessed in bulk through a machine-readable application programming interface or a downloaded for text mining and big data um, type digital humanities research use, such as visual, visualization and statistical analysis. In the near future, the collection is going to continue to expand, and we're going to further integrate that into the library's digital collection. It should not stand as a silo. It should be integrated into our collections so that, we can, so that users can make those connections into the, all the other types of materials that the library has that might be relevant. So sort of as, a, as an immediate concern, um, so even as we expand that type of digital resource here, as we expand other types of digital resources, um, we face challenges um, to our traditional programs that we have here around the newspaper type of format um, because the industry has changed. 
So over time, as document scanning, machine readability, and storage technologies have continued to improve in efficiencies and a decrease in costs, most industries have switched from that physical microfilm world to a more agile, searchable data formats uh, for records management. So changes in newspaper publishing, it's all digital first now, um, desktop publishing layout, direct transmission of printing services, as well as cost cutting based on co uh, the competition in the news industry, have all encouraged the library to alter our collection policies to acquire um, e-prints or PDF facsimiles of print newspapers and harvest born digital uh, online news sites where a physical capture is never possible. So in 2018, the Copyright Office began requiring digital e-print deposits to fulfill the terms of group registration of newspapers. An option many newspaper publishers prefer and which co contributes to the library's collection. To date, more than 50 of the major metros of the country have been registered um, with e-prints received and more than 50 born digital or web-based news sites have been captured through the library's web archiving program and are available from the library's website. So these changes will take time to develop into the same robust collection level development um, that the library has enjoyed in the past, but it's a national role and we're committed to encouraging development in libraries and addressing these challenges, as well as maintaining our collection strength in newspapers and perhaps through other future collaborations. So in this particular area, I see the digital strategy because it's not just about digitizing old newspapers, putting them on the website, it's about this whole transition out of the physical um, through the microfilm into an entirely new digital um, level here for the library, driven largely by the industry. So another embodiment of that digital strategy in action is the recently launched Library of Congress crowdsourcing program by the people. So this pr program is enabled by Concordia, uh, an open source transcription and tagging tool. The goals of By the People are to, one, inspire and engage audiences, two, improve the discoverability and, and legibility of collections, three, build national capacity for open source tools, and four, by communicating about development, build, build upon the success of the Library of Congress um, initiatives. So right now, available at crowdloc.gov, the program extends the work of presenting our collections and maximizes their use while connecting with a spectrum of visitors. Public participation and contributions through the, through the program further augment accessibility and potential use of these collections. Virtual volunteers enter into a two-way relationship with the library. They contribute their valuable time and knowledge to enhance the library's collections. And return, they'll learn some new skills, such as reading cursive, or conducting, <laughs> or conducting online research, and uh, forge a deeper relationship with the library and, uh, and fellow volunteers. So it's been possible to develop this tool and the program due to the collections and knowledge of our curatorial staff. Um, applying the technologies and experiences that were cultivated here at the library. And that work has gone into describing, digitizing, and presenting collections to our many audiences via loc.gov. So By the People helps the library invest in its future with an approach that is evidence-based and measurable and built with insights from previous programs. Additionally, there are practical takeaways from, this, from, from these projects that are applied in designing uh, the By the People program. First, it takes time to complete the cycle of returning crowdsourced data to the original source collections, and in, ingest may also require IT support to match our custom, custom, uh, customized existing workflows. Secondly, volunteers should be adequately supported and trusted. Um, given opportunities and time to learn, participants will normally exceed our expectations. And reviewing exemplar crowd crowdsourcing programs led the By the People team to adopt the following, an iterative development workflow and communication, an active management of a community of participants, preparation of a queue of collections to maximize their use, and designing solutions to receive <coughs> and manage the volume of data and information resulting from public um, contribution. So as a result of these designs, 
we're experiencing exponential growth of this program. In just over six months, over 4,600 volunteers have registered on crowd.loc.gov. Over 34,000 pages have been descri described and are awaiting review. And the By the People team is actively improving the review experience, which is essential to finalizing these transcriptions. Anonymous users uh, are also contributing, and they've submitted over 14,000 um, transcriptions. So we're also building on the library's extensive experience for managing digital content for access and preservation, and this knowledge and related workflows allow us to serve completed transcriptions at the image level in our loc.gov interface, fulfilling the vision of keyword search and discoverability. So we're completing that circle. It's not we're creating metadata in a silo. We're creating it and bringing it back into the collection and enhancing discoverability for everyone that's working through loc.gov. So this month, um, additional transcripts um, from completed pages of Letters to Lincoln, the Clara Barton Diaries, and the Mary Church Terrell's papers um, will also be ingested and presented in loc.gov. And the engagement program continues to grow as new campa campaigns are added. The Walt Whitman at 200 launch uh, was in April to commemorate the poet's uh, bicentennial. And today, uh, a topical suffrage campaign goes live in coordination with the opening of the Shall Not Be Denied exhibit. So By the People is an example of leadership at the national level of making open and available the approaches, the code base, and the content. So it's compelling for many reasons, not the least of which is the thoughtful design. Um, but that we're building a project that optimizes um, for the goals of the Library of Congress. And while we document our tool, we, the process, the programs, and the outcomes, the workflow and the tools continue to be developed through a user-centered design, um, engagement with the participants, and connection to the library's strategic goals. Concordia has been made available as an open source tool from the beginning of its development, and anyone can access the code um, base and documentation on the library's GitHub and request um, features or to log issues. So you see that these approaches um, also connect to the digital strategy and back to the larger library strategy. So I would say, you know, you know, there you have it, sort of. Here are two prime examples of the library's digital strategy um, in action. I think of the National Digital, Library, uh, National Digital Newspaper Program and By the People um, also show that the library uh, in its role as a national library in action. Through NDNP, we're building a national collection by working with connectors across the country to provide permanent access to a free national digital resource built through collaborative aggregation. And through the, and, and through the By the People Program, we are enhancing discovery and providing increased access to a national collection by crowdsourcing transcription of a rich manuscript holdings, and we're pushing our content out through collaborative description. Together, I think these two programs really capture the moment here at the Library of Congress. So in conclusion, by expanding access and enhancing services while being more data-driven and optimizing our resources, we will build a stronger, lifelong, and meaningful connections with the users of today and tomorrow. And that, I think, is an effort that we can all agree is worth supporting. So thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, that was good. And thanks to Angela and Judith for helping set this up and everyone else who worked on this. I, I want to give a, a very special thank you to the person who chose the photographs for the flyers. Um, <laughs> those are quite special. 
The, um, no, no disrespect, Mark, but, um, but the most important thing you're going to learn today and you're going to hear is coming from me here just right now. And that, that is, if you're getting your photo ID taken and someone says, do you want another photo? Say yes. <laughs> so, so I'm done. Um, I've taken care of it. Um, So um, a few months ago, we, we put together a report in response to the new plan and the new digital strategy, looking at how the library profession could support it and add value to it and what, what our role would be in, in the future. And so I want to give you some highlights of this report. And uh, we have some of my colleagues who will be here who aren't on the business analysis team. They're actual librarians who are experts. And, um, they're the real act, so in, in essence, what you're going to get is you're going to have to eat your kale first, and then you'll get the cheese fries <laughs> in a bit. Um, the, but to start off, Mark has already given us a very good overview of where we're going. We have a good, good picture of what we're doing. And in, when we hear user-centered for librarians, we know that's at the heart of our profession. That's who we are. But it doesn't mean that we don't need to keep affirming what we're doing and what we mean by user-centered, and we don't need to keep expanding and enhancing it. And this is a good opportunity for us to do that. Um, and also the vision is we have technology that's very closely tied to the, um, to the vision. And so the big question for us is, is the library profession ready to advance this vision, and with this, especially with this emphasis on technology? And I want to explore that a little bit with you and discuss um, where the library profession is in terms of technology and how we can contribute. So no disrespect to other people, and my, my bent, my focus is, is going to be on libraries, in part because library services is made up of most people who are in the library profession. Um, they're in the library profession series. 78% of our staff are in the library and archive series. About 72% of those are in the library series. So this is the reason for the emphasis, plus the data was pretty easy to get. Um, <laughs> for this, but we have a lot of other um, people who are supporting and providing very specialized roles in library services and they shouldn't go unnoticed and I, I don't mean to, to disrespect them either as much as I did, this is it, Mark. Um, so this is why we're focusing on the library profession. And as we're starting off, if we're going to be emphasizing user-centered, we should be looking at what do digital services do library um, patrons want? What do, they, what do they want and need from us? And before we do that, it's, it's good to take a step back and, and have a good a reminder of the role libraries play in our society. And this is from a, um, a Pew Internet and American Life. They have great, great ongoing studies of um, information and the uses of information in our society. And what I find very fascinating about this is that over 95% of the respondents to a, a 2014 Pew survey said that libraries give us a chance to succeed. You know, they, they, they see libraries as playing an important role in our society, giving people, in a sense, an opportunity to advance themselves. They're, they're equalizers in our society. And that, that has special significance when we're looking and talking about, looking at technology and talking about how we're going to be serving and using technology. It has to be woven into what we're doing um, in the library profession. So when we look more specifically in, in, at samples of what's going on and what, what people are looking for, and these are just examples, you have, to, you have to look across the board, because as the National Library, we're a public library, we're a research library, and we're also a library's library. And there's, there's needs and uses across the board that we're trying to meet, and it's, and it's fairly challenging to do this. Um, on the public side, there's, there's a real need for access when, it, when you look at you know, being able to succeed in our society. It's having access to technology. Um, one of the... the Pew and Internet American Life surveys came out with about 96 of the people, percent of the um, respondents, were in favor of libraries teaching technology. 87% believe that libraries should provide technology access to new technologies so people can come in and learn new technologies like 3D printers or whatever the new technology is at the time. Um, this isn't new. This is not, as us, some of us have been around libraries for a good part of our lives and are, have had quite a long life. The, um, <laughs> We, we remember pre-technology, in essence, in some, many of the libraries, but even in the early 90s, um, the University of Maryland did a study of 
uh, the Maryland public and asked what they thought the, the public library should be providing. And at that time, 83% said that they should be providing software and computer programs that you can check out. So even back in the early 90s, there was this people coming to libraries to get their technology and learn how to use technology. That puts a special burden on librarians. Um, if you turn over to the research side, one of the, I find this, this is fascinating, that this is a, a faculty um, survey from, that Ithaca had put together, and it's from 2015. And what's fascinating about it is that the, the gray bars over on your, um, on your right are showing favorability or at least people leaning towards replacing the print with all electronic. You know, they're open to it. For, you know, I, I come from a research library background, and back in the late 90s, that very first red bar, which is um, saying, do not get rid of them, anything print, keep everything print, and who really cares about the digital, that would have been probably at the, you know, off the chart in terms of height. And it, you just see this gradual shift of faculty doing this. Um, a new library journal recently had a, a survey of faculty and librarians asking faculty what their, um, what their needs were for the library, and they wanted more data and text um, analysis support from the libraries. And then it, by about 52%, 57%, somewhere, I forget the exact number. The, um, what was interesting about that, the librarians only thought that it was around 33% of them said that we should be providing that services. So there's a little bit of out of sync with, uh, um, with the researchers, but I think we're catching up with that. And a strategic plan like this helps us kind of reassess our user needs again and where we're going. When you think of us as a library's library, this library journal, um, and I don't know whether this is a trend or not, it's a year-on-year -year example, but in 2016 to 2017, there, there's a growing dissatisfaction from Library Journal in a survey they had of library directors with the ILS platform that they're using. That they, the ILS platforms, most of which rely on MARC records, are outdated. Um, they can't handle the new information. They're not as flexible as they need to be. And so I think, it, to me, this suggests and it points to the need for our work with BibFrame, things like that, as we're moving forward, to be more flexible, to be advancing the, the profession, and that is yet another area of need that we, we shouldn't forget. Um, so are librarians being prepared to, to meet our users' digital needs? If you go out and you look at the ALA-accredited library schools, you'll find 83% of them have a digital concentration or a technology concentration in the program. And these technology concentrations include things like informatics, technology information and management, data science, social computing. They, there's a lot of these concentrations now you can get with the degrees. 100% of them require technology literacy as part of the program. So if you're an accredited ALA, accredited American Library Association accredited um, program, technology literacy is a requirement of the programs. The placement of library professionals has also changed. Library Journal does an annual look at where people are being placed, and we went in and categorized these. And the dark gray bars, I, I'm not sure, I think it's, it's showing okay. The dark gray bars on here show traditional professions um, that we would consider you know, more the traditional library jobs. And then the medium gray ones are showing ones that you could classify as being more purely digital um, and technology-based. And you'll see that there's a trend moving up. And then there's these really light gray ones, which are kind of odd ones, some of which are uh, libraries are getting new um, social science or um, social media specialists coming in to help with social media. Sorry, not social science, social media. The, this is misleading because even those traditional positions, you can no longer get a traditional position. And it doesn't require technology. If you look at any of the postings, they all require the use of some technology. So that, it's, it's a little bit misleading, but there's certainly trends that you can see in the profession moving. Um, so we, we conducted a survey. We had about 350 um, completed responses from our survey, and we asked professional librarians, what are you doing and what technology are you using on the job and what types of things are you doing? And we'll, we'll kind of go over that, but we don't need to look out there. We don't need to go out and look. We can look inside because we have a lot of stuff going in by, you know, by our staff today, going on by our, that our staff are doing today using technology. And what I'd like to do now is kind of to share some of that with and have my colleagues come up and, 
give some overviews of some of the things and ways that they're using technology in their daily work today and how that's working. So. I'm Ann Mitchell, a digital library specialist in the Prints and Photographs Division. Part of the work I do in P&P involves cataloging and making born digital photographs available and searchable online. Carol Highsmith, a photographer who is traveling to and taking photographs in all 50 states, sends us more than 5,000 born digital photographs every year. She was recently in Arizona. On the left, you have the Space Age Lodge and Restaurant in Gila Bend that she took in 2018. And on the right, this is how I first see the pictures on the hard drive she delivers. Here in this program, Adobe Bridge, you can see a snapshot of some of the embedded metadata she provides in the lower right that we use as a base for creating catalog records. Briefly, here's a summary of the steps I use to create inventory level bibliographic mark records from Highsmith's metadata. I use EXIF tool run in Unix to extract the metadata from the images after we load the images to the server. EXIF tool creates a .csv file with the extracted metadata. You can't see it on this screen, but there are actually more than 100 fields that were extracted. Many, many technical fields related to camera settings, date time fields, and some descriptive metadata fields added by the photographer. We move the descriptive fields, such as description, keywords, geographic location, date, and photographer name to access. Here we use the global update functionality of access to check, clean up, and add project specific information and rename fields to correspond with their destination mark fields. Other tools I use in the process include a text editor. I like to use Notab Lite, Open Refine, and Mark Edit. After the catalog record data is imported to Mark Edit, I use a script I created to quickly add all of the remaining boilerplate fields to the catalog records. Here, all of the data highlighted in, in yellow are fields from access. The remaining unhighlighted fields are the boilerplate fields added with the Mark Edit script. Finally, I send the batch of records to the ILS office for bulk loading to Voyager. After the records are loaded, they are searchable and viewable in the online catalogs. On the right is a view of a Highsmith catalog record in the Prints and Photographs online catalog, which we refer to as PPOC. And on the left, part of the same record with a focus on the image in Project One. So in our survey, when we, uh, we asked our respondents what scripting language they're using, and so overall for the survey, we had over 70% of the respondents are using advanced technology in their daily work lives. Um, and we asked what scripting languages they're using. They came back with they're using things like Python, JavaScript, and a regular basis. And, I, and what I like about Anne's example is that you can't separate that work out from the daily work. You can't put in a service ticket for being able to do some of that scripting in the middle of your work. You know, she has to run these Unix commands. That's just part of the flow of work. And uh, that's a good example of how librarians have begun to integrate technology much more into their jobs. So. Good morning. I'm Amanda Loeb, and I am an archivist in the Manuscript Division. I use technology to appraise, process, describe, preserve, and provide access to born digital material from collections held in the manuscript division. Because the division's born digital holdings exist in a variety of sometimes obsolete file and media formats, 
It can take as many as 15 different tools and software programs to process a single piece of digital media. I use a Microsoft Access database to record metadata about the media and to document any preservation measures taken. I use a command line script to create a directory listing for each piece of media, which documents the original date, timestamps, and file structure. To safely copy the files from the original media and to ensure the fixity and authenticity of the files, I use the bagger tool, which was developed here at the library. When necessary, I create disk images using FTK Imager to extract files from corrupted disks and also to preserve the file relationships in complex digital objects like multimedia packages or audiovisual files. The preservation and reformatting division uses for Forensic Toolkit to search for index terms and generate reports on collection material. The reports allow me to analyze and evaluate the subject matter of a collection as well as locate restricted information. I often use QuickView Plus, a file viewer tool, to access files created in obsolete and unknown formats. QuickView Plus allows me to view files without knowing the type of software they were created with. Often I deal with files that have no extensions or are not recognized by modern operating systems. In this case, I use hex editor software to find file signature numbers and identify file formats. To transform audio files to more preservation friendly formats, I use exact audio copy. I also use a variety of programs and tools to compare files, ensure authenticity, and work with special formats. I'll close with an example of how specialized software tools are essential to the work of ARCFIS in the manuscript division. As we process more digital archival material dating from the 1970s to the present day, we are encountering increasingly complex digital objects that cannot be rendered with current software. The images, the images on this slide are of a file from the Nina V. Fedorov papers processed by a fellow archivist, Chad Conradi. The, Im um, the images were created using MacDraw, an early Apple graphics program. The image on the left was rendered using EasyDraw, a modern software application. You can see that some of the formatting and content of the original image is missing. The image on the right is the same file rendered using an emulator running Apple OS 9 with the original MacDraw program installed. This is exactly how the image would have looked when accessed by Nina Fedorov in the 1980s. You can see this gives us a complete picture of the records we're working to preserve and would not be possible without the ability to create emulated environments using our division lock test machine. It's been an exciting time in the manuscript division as we develop new skills and expertise to process the growing amount and variety of digital archival material coming in with our collections. <clears throat> Just as we work closely with the preservation and reformatting division to extract data from obsolete file formats, we look forward to developing new working relationships throughout the wider library community to provide our patrons with access to this historic material. Thanks, Amanda. So, and then we found out in our survey as well that um, when we asked what data manip manipulation tools are you, people are using, a lot, large percentages are using XML editors, but there's also SQL and other data querying that's fairly popular that people are using on a more regular basis and mark edit and open refine as well and some other tools. Hi, um, so I'm Christy Conkle and I'm a librarian in the collection development office. Um, I analyze bibliographic and other types of metadata to help us better understand the makeup of the collections on a general level, um, as well as to answer specific collection policy related questions. Um, my work involves combining data sets of various sizes, transforming or norm normalizing those data sets, running computations, uh, diving in and analyzing the data, and visualizing the results. I use a wide range of tools to accomplish my work. 
Um, sometimes the projects I work on are straightforward, uh, like determining how many books in the collection were published in a particular date range. So applications like Access and Excel get the job done. <clears throat> Other times it can be more in depth, like analyzing our automated call slip data to better understand collection use uh, for the collection development uh, office's project uh, related to collection use. Um, I'm analyzing automated call slip data by format and fiscal year. Uh, for this project, I use access to run queries against information that's within the uh, ILS. Um, I load that data into Tableau's prep a data cleaning tool that allows me to combine and record how I've transformed the initial data set. Um, and then it allows me to generate uh, data visualizations based on specific characteristics of the data set for further analysis, um, such as this chart, which is slightly blurred out, um, uh, that shows automated call slip requests uh, in a particular fiscal year broken down by class and year of publication. Um, Additionally, uh, taking that same sort of data set um, and exploring it in, in charts like this that show the language of publication for books published in Brazil that were requested during that fiscal year. Another example of my work uh, would be an analysis that I did to see if any of the 20 million records in one data set matched any of the 16 million bibliographic records in the library's catalog. Uh, at the start of the project, it was unclear if any of uh, the information was shared between uh, the data sets, uh, um, if there was a unique um, identifier between them. Uh, for this work, I used MARC RTP and a tool called BINHAX to identify issues related to character anomalies or mismatched fields in the primary data set. Uh, later, after finishing the encoding, I broke apart the MARC records uh, using an application called Giraffe so that all of the data elements in the MARC records would be exposed for querying. I loaded the millions of records into a MySQL database, um, the size of which uh, the database uh, required access to a virtual server. And I then created even more MySQL tables on the fly to run queries and analyze the data and uh, also to normalize the data between the two data sets. And more queries, and more queries, and more queries. Thank you, Christy. I, I think Christy's example resonates with um, what we're seeing out, and it should be what databases up here, sorry about the, the heading, but uh, many of the users that responded to the survey, I mean the, the respondents to the survey, were saying that they were using MySQL um, as well as some other database types in their regular work. Christie's is a special situation in a, in a sense because her work on a virtual server working with a database doesn't follow our typical IT models where you have a test database, then you move it over into staging and into production. She's actually building and rebuilding that database all the time in basically a production or kind of a staging type of environment. And there's a lot of, as you saw from more queries and more queries, there's just a lot of movement going on in her work. Um, so. Hi, I'm Ryan. I'm a reference librarian in the Prints and Photographs Division. Um, Every day, I combine my knowledge of the collections with expertise in metadata and software. Uh, the skill sets are intertwined. In helping research in general, I need to know not just about the collections themselves, but also the search techniques that will be the most effective in navigating through those collections. In a division of 16 million items, I need to understand how internal divisional databases, library catalogs, and search engines, and other discovery platforms function behind the scenes in order to search successfully myself and then guide researchers in locating relevant pictures. Um, in addition to responding to patron queries, reference librarians also proactively try and anticipate informational needs that exist and skills that would benefit our researchers. I recently taught a workshop for researchers on how to use Zotero and Adobe Bridge to keep track of collection items and metadata accessed as part of their research in the prints and photographs division. In this effort, again, I needed to know the structure of metadata to advise them on how that data could be captured most easily and accurately. I also needed to have a solid understanding of how computing can save researchers time, more or less, and the types of organizing options available for different uses of imagery and data in combination. 
Finally, I needed expertise in digital file formats to guide them in downloading, file naming, and organizing their selections so that images can be used to best effect in their research outcomes. Understanding web and print publishing platforms and standards for digital files helps researchers planning to publish to understand what they can already access and what they might need to order as a scan. I regularly translate publisher specifications for resolution and color profiles to patrons trying to use PNP images. Um, I like to keep up with interesting projects coming out of LOC Labs so I can prepare for questions from patrons interested in engaging with our data at a more advanced level. Um, I get questions from people wanting bulk mark data downloads, trying to understand how our APIs work, um, or who are applying or thinking of applying for the Teaching with Primary Sources software development funding opportunities. Um, in a sort of related internal library request, it was a natural fit for me to guide a communications office intern into locating rights-free, family-friendly photos for the new Chrome extension. Um, as a reference librarian of a library with considerable architectural collections, I am currently involved in a national working group of archivists and librarians that are grappling with the mounting issues in collecting electronic architectural and design records. Um, we're working through the issues of accessioning, appraising, describing, and serving drawings made with obsolescing or frequently versioned um, software programs for computer-aided design and building information modeling. Um, Librarians, besides myself and PNP, are involved in the early stages of the story maps exploration at the library. We know many of our collections could benefit from GIS-based discovery rather than simply keyword search, so we are looking forward to further exploring story maps as well as more advanced use of ArcGIS um, to enhance discovery and engage our users. And finally, I am looking forward to taking a coding workshop as more researchers explore and rely on computational analysis tools. My toolkit needs things like Python programming knowledge and other computational techniques to help fuel innovation. Um, helping researchers mine and manipulate data is a critical part of my job, which is to say our public users rely on reference librarians to help translate the millions of library bits and bytes into meaningful connections and research products. Thank you, Ryan. The, what, especially what Ryan said at the end there is very important, you know, that, that she wants to continue to learn and to, to continue to grow. And Library Journal, uh, no, an article, which I have cited down here, um, Riley Huff and Rolls, found that professionals, in a survey they conducted out, that professionals, library professionals, learn and develop their skills on the job more than they do in the professional schools. And the dark gray shows where they're learning these technology or these technical skills, and it's on the job that they're learning them. And so I, I think Ryan's eagerness to learn more is, is reflective of that. It's a growing profession, um, and it's an important issue. So looking back at sort of the, the report and going back to what we, we, we came up with and when we, we did the analysis and looked at the, um, how we could be serving and how we could be um, advancing the library's new vision and, uh, and overall and also its technology vision, if we ask where we're going, we have a, Mark has shown us, you know, we have a pretty good idea of where we're going. Um, it's, it's very clear, but we're, in doing that, we are faced with some challenges, and I, I think one of the challenges that we have is that we can very, very easily be divided into kind of groups of those who innovate and those who work, and that, you know, there, there's a separation between you know, the, the people who are out there doing being creative, and then there's other people, you just got to get the work done. And what we need to do, and that, that's something that we need to do, I think, uh, and as individuals, is that we need to engage and, and work to innovate from within to find ways to improve, to find ways to learn, to be, to be more creative and be persistent. You know, innovation and invention take persistence. They don't just happen overnight. Their, their change is hard and difficult. And if we're going to be really advancing this plan, it's incumbent upon us to keep moving forward and keep trying to engage and keep, you know, we'll hit doors, but just we'll have to keep trying. Um, and I think that we're, librarians especially are well suited to that. Um, being a librarian myself, it's a little bit of, but, uh, the, the profession is very much a learning profession. Um, there's also the challenge that we face is that risk aversion will inhibit innovation. Um, you know, that we're, we're so worried about the risk 
that will will stop innovation and will be we be too hesitant. And so there, it's right for us to be worried about risk. You know, our connection to Congress, where we are, um, we're a federal institution. We should be concerned about risk. We shouldn't um, poo-poo it too much, but we can find ways to deal with it. So we can limit technological risk by identifying um, pathways to innovation. We're calling these pathways where rather than people going off on their own and just building something and then later we have to clean it up or someone else has to take it on, we need to find pathways to innovate, pathways to get those innovations into production. And so we're working on things to do that. Um, we also can limit risk by creating safe spaces. And originally it, this was phrased as being more safe technological spaces, but I think we should be thinking of this more, more um, encompassing of being safe spaces in general for testing, for learning, for experimenting, for failing and succeeding. And that you know, we encourage each other and we, we help bring our, um, our future into reality by being a, a supportive but also a learning organization that doesn't just always latch on to the failures but also looks at ways that we can succeed and learn from those failures and move on in, in advance. So safe spaces aren't just about technology, I think it's a culture as well. So are librarians prepared to meet users' digital needs? I think they really are. I mean, what we've seen from the, the evidence, I mean, this is, we'll, we'll make sure everyone has a, a link to the report, but we went through and it, it's very clear the profession has geared up over the last couple of decades and changed dramatically to be in line with um, the changes in technology. And there, there's been quite a shift in the programs, the accredited programs throughout the nation. The, the challenges that we face is that, you know, we might not realize the full potential of the profession um, and staff skills and talents might go untapped. So again, back to the notion of pathways, we've got to find pathways, we've got to create these pathways to get work done so that people with some scripting skills can do that scripting and um, can share that scripting with others, but we can also replicate it and reuse it so we're not dependent just on one person when that, when that person goes away or um, you know, the job changes. You know, sometimes we'll be stuck with a script that no one knows how to use anymore. So we need to find ways to make that a little bit more stable, and we're working on that, um, putting those together. We also have, I think, a, a, a larger risk is that, in terms of, or a challenge, and that is that the Library of Congress might find it hard to attract and retain librarians if the work of the library does not parallel work in the profession. So librarians need to be able to do, as we've been seeing and, and we're hearing, a lot of this work with technology. Um, and so we need to actively seek out and pursue opportunities to use and grow professional skills, skills especially technological skills, um, moving forward, and, and we're working on that. Um, so how can, overall, how can the library profession contribute to the library's, Library of Congress's vision and digital strategy? By being librarians, you know, <laughs> at, the, at the end of the day. So what's next? Well, what's next is, you know, for those in the library, we know that there's been sort of a role re-identification and role clarification has been going on over the, the last few years where we've, we've, had to, we've had consolidation of IT and we've been saying this is, this is purely IT work and, and here's librarian work. What's next is kind of something that's a little messy and that's finding that gray, gray area and defining that gray area where, the, where there's overlap between the, the profession and IT and working through that and we're doing that. We've already started initiatives with OCIO to do this um, working on some of these pathways and we'll be trying to communicate those out over time. Um, but it, we all need to figure out ways to do this and to, to engage, but take it for granted that change is messy and that this, the blurring of roles will take some clarification, will take a lot of conversations and some debate, but I think that we, by doing this, we can help advance the overall vision and goal. So, so with that, I'll, um, if you have any questions, Mark's here. And, <laughs> Yes. So uh, I hope all of you have been stimulated, fortified, and feel good about where you are in terms of being at the library and being a librarian or in our uh, environment. Are there questions for either Mark um, 
or Steve or the group. We have a few minutes. Hi, on the um, By the People initiative, is there any quality control by subject matter experts of the transcriptions? The software developers who work on By the People, and I, I think one of the things coming out of um, Steve and Mark's excellent presentation about what librarians do is that we probably ought to have a corresponding uh, presentation about what does IT even mean. <laughs> um, I think as I was as I was looking through it, I thought, oh yeah, that that all makes great sense, but I think it's rooted in some. Uh, so I'm an IT person, and I think the question about our are transcripts reviewed by subject matter experts? Was that the question? Um, so the, the the short answer to that is uh, they're created by people who become subject matter experts, literally on our site, crowd.loc.gov, um, and who are assisted by the subject matter experts of the library. If you look at the prototype that launched last week, one of the things that we're we're experimenting with is putting the staff expertise about the collections much closer to where we do the transcriptions and um, having it just uh, like a, a click away that's kind of in, even in the middle of, middle of the screen. Um, so the transcripts get created by somebody on crowd.lsc.gov. They get reviewed by somebody on crowd.lsc.gov. And then they come back to the library in a batch, and they go through the ETL process, which is extract, transform, and load, which is, again, like IT speak for that's, that's how we load them into the system here. Um, every part of the library's website, including like um, digitized images or you know, virtually any part, then gets onto our staging site where um, when we stage content, the, it gets reviewed by the, the staff who um, are responsible for each of the collection areas. Um, and that process has become routine over the past 10 years, the, the process of releasing new collections, including whether it be transcripts or uh, whether it be a digitized image or whether it be a, a digitized video. Or um, So the, 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 the long-winded answer to your question is that the review of this is done by the same mechanisms that we use to review all of the other digitized materials that, that, that flow through and into LOC.gov. Um, but it's also true that sometimes with all of these collections, um, and I, uh, Rachel Mears and I have had some great conversations about things that have gone through the digitization process for the Veterans History Project that we've discovered belatedly had some really interesting things in it, right? This is a thing we've been doing at the library for a long time. We get things all the way through the process and we find that it does or does not meet some standard that we have in the profession for, for what's up there. And the the next thing that we do is is continue to iterate on those materials even while they're online. So if there's something wrong, if there's something, and that includes something wrong that's been found by a member of the public or a member of the library staff that has gotten out there, we're not at the point where we can't touch that, where we can't, we, we can't review that. In fact, we now have the ability to version that and get a new version out and take it through the, that virtuous cycle that Mark is, um, and I really, it is really a virtuous cycle that feeds all, you know, through, through in a circle um, because everything that you're digitizing now and putting online at loc.gov then becomes a candidate to feed into by the people. By the people then makes it more discoverable. As it becomes more discoverable, we discover more things about it that we didn't know. Maybe that this name was transcribed incorrectly, or um, and that that is participated in, it not just by library staff but also by subject matter experts, kind of all over the world. I hope that d does that kind of answer the question is it okay Regina Reynolds and I have a question for Mark I hope it doesn't put you on the spot too much I am uh, indeed inspired enthusiastic uh, the vision is exciting 
but has the library leadership thought about how to translate that vision into how people are evaluated all the way down the line and how time is allocated down the line. It's exciting to think of people having time to be creative, but a lot of those people, as Steve said, are really doing the work, being evaluated by numbers, and if they don't deliver the numbers, they're not going to be as, as well evaluated. So how can we change the reward system, the time allocation system, so we get more creativity, more enthusiasm, and really more adherence to these wonderful visions? No, there's a couple of different ways to answer it. And first of all, you know, when you look at the goals and the objectives, that's at the highest level, okay? So every service unit has been charged with putting together a directional plan, okay, which, which takes it right down to the, to, the, to the activities and programs and services that you all are doing in your particular service unit and identifying the initiatives um, that they want to do over the next five years. Um, it's really important because you know, you, then you take those directional plans and you see all the initiatives that are wanted at, at, at various times, whether they, what years, whether there are existing resources for it or not, and then what other units within the library have to support those initiatives. So the directional plans then are turned over to infrastructure, COO, CIO, and we wanna make sure that we can sync all of this up and be able to move on things that have been identified as being important because um, we're gonna support each other in doing it and that the resources are available. And when I say resources, I'm thinking primarily money because a lot of these initiatives will require additional funding, new, new funding from Congress, new funding from donors, all sorts of different sources. You know, performance management is incredibly important. Um, you know, it's part of the reason why optimizing resources is one of, our, one of our three goals, because we need to get more out of, um, you know, our staff, out of our systems, out of our collections. And while we, while we anticipate that we will get additional resources from Congress to do some of the work we need to do, we're gonna have to get efficiencies out of what we already have. Technology will help, but as we look to optimize, we also want to be more data-driven because you have to look at programs and you have to say, okay, are we, are we really delivering the benefit that we think we should get out of this? Should we continue it? Should we change it? Should we stop it? In order to free up resources for things that we think are really important today. So I'm, I'm not going down into the individual performance plans and all of that, except to say that we've outlined through directional plans at the service unit level a lot of really exciting things that I'd like to see happen over the next five years. But we're gonna need to be realistic that in order to do that, we're gonna have to really optimize our resources and make some decisions not based on anecdote and how one may feel about a particular program but because there's some real data behind it that says it has an impact, that it's worth doing, and that we want to, we want to drive some existing resources to it, or it's something that is of not of the value maybe that it used to be, or it's, it's, it doesn't have enough broad enough base to really support it, and then we have to move those resources over to some other things that can have a bigger impact. So, all right. Probably couldn't end on a better note than <laughs> no, it's 11.30. We shall end with the de principal deputy librarian. Thank you. So join me in thanking him. <laughs> <laughs>